Okay. Just commit the word to God. Father, we thank you for your presence and your awesomeness. Lord, that we've had the opportunity to come right into your very throne room. And Lord, we thank you for your word, which is truth that we can stand on. And Lord, as we come around your word, Lord, we pray for this fresh revelation on, on what you want us to hear, what you want us to see. Lord, as we open ourselves up to your Holy Spirit just to move and give revelation to each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The book of Ephesians is probably one of my favourite books in the Bible. I don't really know why, but I, if you look in my Bible, not this one, but the one I used to study, it's probably the most underlined, written in book in the Bible. The, the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the, the Ephesian church. It was a church that he'd started. He was the founding pastor of it. And, and then he handed the church over and, and he made several trips back to the church of Ephesus to to minister there. He spent some time there ministering to him. So it was a church that was close to his heart. And the, the Ephesus church had um, was, was a great church. It had grown. The, uh, the city of Ephesus was a, a major city at that time. And a lot of, um, it was basically the, the crossroad. Everything went through it. You know, all the travellers going to the various parts of, of the world would travel through the Ephesus, church, uh, Ephesus city. And it was a rich, prosperous city. But the church had kind of lost its way in, in a way that it had um, become comfortable in a way with its material things and and Paul wrote this letter, not only to the church of Ephesus, but it was, a, it was a letter that was sent to that church, but it was also meant to be handed around to the various other churches. And the letter to the Ephesians, it, it's full of great things and, and great promises. You know, he, he says in Ephesians 1.3 that God has blessed us with very, very spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. You know, we're told in, in verse 4 that he chose us. You know, we often get into our head that we, we, we make decisions to accept Christ, but Christ chose us. In Ephesians 2.1, he tells us that we are made alive who are dead in trespasses and sin. In Ephesians 2.8, one of my, my favourite verses in the Bible, tells us that we're saved by grace. You know, we don't have to work for our salvation. You know, we don't have to do anything really we just have to accept God's grace and accept God and you know, we're saved by grace not works and Ephesians 3.20 tells us that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think or even imagine and as I shared with, the, with our vision meeting yeah, you know, I don't know about you but my imagination can run pretty big and you know and we think okay how big is God and we imagine how big he is well that's not even close you know he, he can do more than that and then in Ephesians 4 he talks about the power of the body when it functions and works correctly when every part of the body is working together see Paul continually reminds us that we're living in a new life in Christ but we're not to forget where we came from. And the reason he tells us not to forget where we came from is twofold. One is that we're not to forget others that were like we were. Just because we've managed to climb out of the hole, we've got to remember that there's still other people in the hole that need to be pulled out. And two, so that we don't get too big for our boots. You know, we often we think, well, I've made it, you know, I'm, I'm not like those people in the world. Look at them in their sin. But we're only where we are 
because of Christ. See, throughout the book of Ephesians, Paul reminds us of what reminds us and, and them of what we've been but what we are now. So often we forget the bad things when we're living in the good life. You know, we, we, you talk to people and things years ago were, were always better. You know, the world was a better place. You know, you know, we, we like to reminisce about the good old days. But when we were in the good old days, they weren't that good at times. And, and we, we forget you know, the struggles and the bad things that were happening. <coughs> See, our testimony is a powerful thing. And when we look back to where we come from, to where we are now, But we also need to look forward and not dwell on the past. You know, Paul constantly reminds us in, and not only in the book of Ephesians, but various other books that he wrote, not to dwell on the past. He says in Philippians 3, 13, he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehend it, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, Paul was telling us, you know, you got to look forward. You know, if you're running a race, it's no good looking behind you all the time. You've got to look forward where, you, where you're going. See, an alcoholic should never forget that he's an alcoholic. And that's one thing that they apparently teach you if you go to the AA. But he shouldn't spend all his time thinking about alcohol. But look at where he is now and where he's going. And it's the same with us. Too often, and it's a tactic of the, of the enemy, is the enemy likes you to get, get you focused on your sin, your past mistakes. And we get so focused on our past sins that we take our focus off God. We need to focus on God and not on our sin. We, we acknowledge that we had that sin in our life, it's dealt with, and we've moved on. So it's all about attitude, whether we have old life attitude or new life attitude. The Israelites, when they flee in Egypt, start thinking the old life attitude. They had been promised by God that he was going to take them out of Egypt, deliver them, and move them into the promised land. So they had so much to look forward to. But what happened was that they started thinking the old life attitude. They started focusing on it wasn't so much better when we were in Egypt. The woe is us. Instead of focusing on God and saying, okay, we're going to look forward to the promised land. We're going to move into the promised land. But instead they, they focus on the old life and they start to complain. They think, well, it was pretty good when we had it in Egypt. They forgot how bad it was. See, Paul reminds us to think new life. In 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need to make sure that we have the new life attitude. that we put the old life behind us, our old attitude behind us. <coughs> In Philippians 2.5, it tells us that we have the same mind as Christ. We need to know who we are. And that's 
one of the things, if we don't know who we are, then the enemy will challenge us on it and try and get us to focus back on the old, old attitude. You know? 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent, or the King, King James Version says, or the study, to present yourself approved to God, a work who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Ephesians 4.14 says that we should no, should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried around with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftsmen's deceitful plotting. We need to know who we are. Because the enemy will constantly try and get you back to the old life thinking. He'll, he'll bring up, he's very good at it, and we're pretty good at it ourselves. We remind ourselves often of, uh, of that sin that I, I did, you know, that, that bad thing I did last week. But if we've confessed it, give it to God, it's dealt with. But we often come back and dwell on it. We, we get in the habit of we, we come to the cross and we lay all our stuff down at the bottom of the cross and we give it to God and we stand there for a minute, and then as we're about to move off, we think, well, hang on, I'll, I'll just take that with me instead of leaving it with it. But if we know who we are, we know that we, we are righteous, we are holy in God, not by anything that we did, but by what he did on the cross. If we have the same mind as Christ, we're not bound by the old life, we're not bound by our sin and flesh. You know, we won't allow the devil to bring up our past mistakes and failures. We won't allow him to lay that sin on, on us that has been dealt with. You know, John 8.31 says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And we can say, well, every time the devil tries to lay something on us, we say, well, no, that's dealt with. We've moved on with it. That, God's forgiven me, I've confessed it, he's moved on. And if we've got the same mind as Christ, then we're not big-headed. Because in Philippians 2, verse 6, it says, Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. Jesus had the right to be big-headed. He, he was God. But he laid that all aside with a servant heart. And if we are to have the same mind as Christ, we've got to have that same attitude of, of serving. So when we're under attack, it's so easy to revert to the old life. And the devil loves nothing more than trying to bait you to get you fired up. You, know, you might have had a problem of anger and you've dealt with it and God's given you a release. But then the devil's pretty good at bringing some annoying person into your life that's going to try and provoke you. And you try and do the right thing. You try and be the nice Christian and, and, that, and they just keep probing and jabbing at you and too often it's easy to revert to the old life but the rewards for pushing through in the new life are so much better now the Israelites had so many promises from God but yet they started the old life attitude and they whinged and they sucked and they said well it was so much better in Egypt why can't we go and back to Egypt, it's all Moses' fault, why did he do this, why didn't he do that? And they winced and they sucked. And they took their focus off what was ahead of them and started looking behind and the result was that they all missed the promised land. When we're under attack, we need to not revert to our old life. We need to go to God. In Psalm 46.1 it says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present in help. When we're in trouble, we need to say, make our mind that 
I'm going to go to God regardless. I like watching these documentaries where you watch these lions. They work as, as a group and they prowl around and they spot the herd of deer and they work out their tactics and they scatter the deer and they try and what they try and do is they try and separate one deer from the rest of the pack. And they used to try and go for the weak one. And they, all, the, all the deer take off that way and there's one deer that makes a mistake and goes that way and the lions have got him. I end up always breaking for the deer. Um, probably wrong, but I do like, come on, get away. But, and that's the same with, with the enemy. He will try and separate us and pull us aside. But we've got to make sure that we're going to run to God and not not away from God because he'll bring up the old life and he'll say God doesn't want anything to do with you because of that thing that you did yeah you know? or you know, if the people in the church knew what you were like what you did they wouldn't want to hang around you and he'll try and bring that stuff up all the time but if it's dealt with that's the old life we new creation and that's why we need to be under cover of others not forsaken the gathering together. In Hebrews 10, 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of up ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. We need to be under the cover of others. You know, I, I spoke in, in the vision document about mentoring each other and, and getting alongside somebody that you could share your heart with. You know, if you're going through a struggle, get along with somebody that can, can encourage you. We need to look out for each other. We need to cover each other. And, and if this person's struggling a little bit, we need to say, I'm going to get alongside you. We don't need to pry and say, okay, what, what's your deep secret that you're doing? Unless they want to share. But you know, get alongside and say, okay, I'll just notice you seem a bit struggling. Can I pray with you or can I stand with you? you know? Do you want to get together and have a bit of a, a prayer time or, or you know, a Bible study? We need to minister, the body ministering to the body and, and Paul encourages the Ephesian church to do that to, to get under the covering of, of the fivefold ministry of the apostle, the pastor and evangelist etc but also for the, for the body to minister to the body to, to exhort one another that means encouraging along and, and it may, may just a simple thing like you know, how are you going? You, know, you want to catch up with Kappa? You, know, you seem a bit down. You want to catch up with Kappa? We need to be under the covering. Now, I'm not going to go on this deep because we're running out of time, so I'm just giving you the bare bone. But I would encourage you to get into the, the book of Ephesians and just, just read it. In Ephesians 5, Paul talks about that we need to walk wisely, not as fools. We need to submit to one another in the fear of God. And that's, once again, a bit like mentoring. You know, we need to watch out for each other or listen to others. You know? I submit myself to certain people and they've got permission to speak into my life and say, OK, you're going off track here or or you're a bit wacky thinking here, you know, what, what you're doing. So when we submit to others, it's not that we're, we're weak. It's just saying, okay, I'm going to let somebody watch my back. Now, I listen to, very widely, I, I submit myself to Elaine. Now, I'll run a lot of things by her, you know. I'll, I'll say to her, well, I feel God saying this, what do you reckon? And she might say, yeah, she's been thinking the same thing. Or sometimes she might think, well, that's a bit 
bit out there. What, what, where, you, where you going with that? But you know, what? Richard and Marion have had great input into my life, and I trust and value their their wisdom. You know, Max and Jill, another couple that uh, are very wise. Max doesn't say a lot, and Jill doesn't say much either. But when they say something, it's, it's worth listening to. And and Keith, you know, we we we'll catch up and and just run f through ideas and, and how we're going. But we need to submit ourselves to each other um, and, and give certain people permission, you know, to say, OK, you, you have my permission to come and challenge me and say, how are you going with God? What's God doing in this area of your life? You're struggling in this area. How are you going with that? You know, are you still struggling? Do you need a hand with it. And in Ephesians 5, a lot of men take it out of context. So it talks about the wife submitting to the husbands. And a lot of people say, oh, okay, that means that the wife's got to do what I tell them. But it doesn't, doesn't mean that. It says, wives submitting to their own husbands as to the Lord. So it doesn't mean the master or the slave relationship, but a relationship of Christ to the church. The protector and the provider of the house is what the wife gets when I mean, she's, she's under the covering of the, the husband. So the husband should provide spiritual nourishment and protection. The husband is responsible for the spiritual covering of the house. And unfortunately, many men fail to do this and the woman has to step up and do it. But it's not her role. We're told in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. When you look at Christ, how he loved the church, he gave everything, you know, and we as husbands need to do that. We need to be prepared to do that for our wives and our families to, to not only show leadership but also the servant attitude of serving and looking after our household. So if we're living in a master or slave relationship, then it's wrong. Christ, although he was entitled to come as a king and rule and reign and be served, took the opposite. He came with a servant heart and a servant attitude. I'm just going to skip through. I'm going to jump down to the end of my notes because we're, we're running out of time. Another thing Paul talks about in, in Ephesians is the parent-child relationship. We're told to honour our father and our mother. And that's a real struggle in the world at the moment. There's no, no honour given to parents in the world, to people in authority. You know, I remember when I was little, we were taught so much to respect and honour the authority that we were under. You know, the teachers, the police were so respected. You know, I always remember, it still sticks in my mind, my nana gave me a good hide one time because we were staying at her place and I'd been to school and I picked up a new word. <laughs> um, and it was pig to describe place. I didn't know what it meant. And the cop car drove past and I said, well, there goes the pigs. And she gave me a whop and a half. I said, if I ever hear you call the police that again, look out. And my nana was pretty gentle, usually. But I've got a friend who's a policeman and he, he tells me his first... First day on the job, he's in uniform and he's walking down the street in Trelgan 
and this little four-year-old come up to him and said, you're nothing but an F and F and P. And he thought, well, so he knelt down and he started talking to this little kid. So he shouldn't be talking to policemen like that, you know. And then the mum come up and he thought, well, the mum will put him in line. And he said, I was just talking to your son. He's swearing and carrying on and he called me an F and F and pig. And mum said, well, that's what you are, aren't you? Yeah, so, so. But the world teaches us we don't have to respect authority anymore. The world teaches children to do what feels right, that your parents haven't got the right to tell you what to do. But Paul says that we're to honour our father and our mother. We're to respect and honour the authority that's been placed. And that includes the government, whatever party's in power. We might not agree with it, but we've got to respect it and, and honour it. The world teaches every man for himself that you're your own master, you don't have to submit to anyone, no one has the right to tell you what to do. You can cheat, lie, abuse, do whatever you need to do to get ahead. The result we see in the world is sin reigning in people's lives. We see marriage and family breakdowns. But we're called to be different to the world. We're, we're called to be a new life in the world. John 17 14 says, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Ephesians 5, 8, Paul tells us that we're the walk as children and life. In Galatians 2, 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. As I said, I, I love the book of Ephesians because it's got so many truths and so many treasures in there. And I like how Paul is able to bring things out. He, he's, he's, he's very good at giving you a smack over the, the head to say, you're out of line, this is how you do it, and this is what you should do. <coughs> But he also says, this is why you should do it and this is the reward because this is who you are. And we've got to remember who we are and why we are what we are because it's not what we've done but what Christ has done in us. 